Einen wunderschönen guten Tag aus Berlin. Hi, my name is Matthias Willich and today I'll talk about how to strategically plan your research for your PhD or your postdoc. Now, I'm only going to be talking about the research part and of course, in order to complete a PhD successfully or also to complete a postdoctoral um, assignment successfully, there's other things surrounding that that uh, have to do with effective communication with a healthy work-life balance and so on and so forth and I'm not going to talk about this here. This also starts with of course picking a suitable and helpful advice and um, I'm assuming this has all happened and now you are tasked with um, planning your research and so how do you do that most effectively? So I'm going to talk about four points here. The first one is to diversify The second one is to collaborate. The third one is to multitask. And the fourth one is to be open and flexible. So let's take them from the top. The first one is how to diversify. And by that I mean don't put all your eggs in one basket. Because that is probably really a recipe for disaster. So um, diversifying your research, um, that can mean a number of different things. For example, um, most of those examples are taken from ecology, but if, you're, um, if your task is to do a field experiment or a field observational study, also consider that experiments very often fail. Um, during my PhD, almost all of my experiments failed was a, not a good experience, but in the end this was still successful because I had done a number of these things and one of them was to diversify. So that means also consider as part of your PhD or postdoc to write opinion papers or reviews or engage in research synthesis exercises like sometimes it's called research weaving, bibliometrics or systematic mapping or in more formal quantitative analyses of uh, existing data, like in a meta-analysis. I think this is super important to have this in your repertoire. I think it makes you more uh, well-rounded as a, as a scientist, especially in, in our field, environmental sciences and ecology. Uh, but I also, it is, a, it is a very valuable part of diversifying your portfolio. And this is something that you can, for example, work on um, also when labs are closed, for example, but um, also when other things simply don't work out. So this is um, have a, an increasing repertoire of the types of things that you do, including opinion papers, review paper synthesis, and so on and so forth. Also, mostly um, you will have a project where the system is already predetermined, like you're working on boreal forest or grassland, let's say, or on um, a soil. Um, but sometimes there is also within a project the opportunity to look at sort of simpler systems, sub -sub subsystems of this more complex system, for example. If you're working on fungal communities in soil, for example, consider also working with individual fungal isolates in a much more controlled setting because chances are that um, treatment effects will be more clear, that you can replicate better and that you can you control your environment much better. And when I was a graduate student, I still remember a lecture, this is now many years ago, but from Kevin Rice at UC Davis. And he told people always in his talk about the thesis insurance. So when you're doing field experiments or field observational studies, which are a lot of work and you are the most prone to um, demonic intrusions, let's call them, like a really unusually bad dry year or, or whatever or the destruction of your of your field site it is always important to have a thesis insurance and that is an experiment that maybe is under much more of your control for example in a greenhouse or uh, in a controlled environment setting so think of these thesis insurance projects uh, but another point is always be trying out little things you try to set up little exploratory studies that um, 
mostly will fail, but they will also not take too much of your time. Um, they should be designed so that they don't take too much of your time away from your main project, of course, but sometimes they lead very useful insights and they can result also in contributions to a, a chapter, for example, of your PhD. And uh, very importantly, I think it is extremely bad if you have an exciting idea that you want to pursue, but you don't have in your mix of your portfolio of the research that's going on. Also not something that is pretty guaranteed to work. So you need to really balance very carefully high risk, high payoff with much more sure to work and perhaps somewhat less exciting work because they are the ones that are going to give you your PhD. And if you're in a postdoc, they help you keep up your productivity if your pet project happens to not work out. So all of that means diversify and don't put all your eggs in one basket. The second point is to collaborate and network. I think this, the importance of that cannot possibly be overstated. It is so important. This is also the experience I had from, from my PhD. As I said, um, due to no fault of my own, in this case, a lot of those experiments failed because of uh, failing ex um, environmental controls. And um, so what I did then is got on the phone and try to call up people that were running similar experiments. In my case, it was elevated CO2 experiments. And that led to, in the end, me getting a PhD. It was this active networking um, and collaborating approach. And I think that is just extremely important that you practice that. Now, not everybody has this outgoing personality. I don't really either. <laughs> Um, and I get sweaty hands when I have to call somebody on the phone, but um, it is so worth it. And the networks uh, that you create early on, and sometimes they can, they can last a very long time. So they can accompany you throughout a, a lot of your career and they can, answer, can enhance your productivity um, in a sustained fashion. And there's data that actually shows that sustained networks really increase productivity quite a bit. So. Uh, invest in these networks. They are also uh, a huge part of your success. Of course, networking with people is also fun um, and it is a particularly effortless way to learn by uh, basically just picking somebody's brain. And that is also important. Ask the people that know. Um, they may not be in your immediate surroundings, Maybe they're in the lab next door, or maybe they're a specialist somewhere at another university, but um, do seek the input you need, of course, communicate with your advisor or mentor, of course, but um, it is very important that you get the pertinent expertise, and that also sometimes really means collaborating with other people. So the third part is to multitask. And I see that very often that people push away, for example, the writing part of doing research until the very end. I think it's a bad idea. So one of the advice I give people when they come into my lab is always write, 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 write all the time. Um, write things in English. Don't take notes in your, in your own language if it's not English. Shift over to English and always be writing. Uh, write parts of the introduction, um, assemble parts of notes and bullet points for the discussion or keep track of the methods, always write things down. Ideally, at some part of your PhD and definitely in your postdoc, you should come in a mode where you have projects at all these different stages. So you can guarantee also an effective way to produce output. Um, that, that is super important. Also during your PhD, you should be writing some things. You should be conceptualizing some ideas for setting up experiment. You should have an experiment running and you should be analyzing experiment. Of course, you can't do that when you start. Um, but, you know, after a period of time, you really should get into this mode where you multitask and you have all these different uh, stages of projects running. This is particularly important for your postdoc. So you uh, should come in set up experiments, work on maybe um, an opinion paper or review paper, and always be uh, in some stage of a project after a period of, say, depending on what the work you do, of course, <clears throat> maybe a year or so, you should be in this mode where you really have projects at all kinds of developmental stages. It's super important to keep a continuity of output. And also, you know, during a PhD, you don't have an endless amount of time. Sometimes these three years in 
Europe or four or five years in the US or wherever you are, they, they go by extremely fast, especially when things don't work out. And if you're not in this mode, chances are you, you'll you have a hard time finishing it up in time. So get into this mode um, where you set up experiments very quickly. I made the terrible mistake during my PhD that I, t it took me forever to um, decide what I wanted to do as an experiment. And so I am I had to really hurry up in the very end to get it all done. And it was only possible because I had so many things going on at the same time and had this multitasking and this is an essential skill and you should get into the mode that you do that. Now you have to discover what's best for you with this multitasking, how you do it. Um, for example, it may be certain times of day, um, of the day when you are better at doing certain things than at other uh, times of the day or uh, whatever it takes for you to get organized so that this works seamlessly, um, do it. And the last part is also important, be flexible and open. Now, when you come with a PhD with a funded project or you're on, on a scholarship or as a postdoc, you have a fellowship or you have a grant that you have to deliver. Of course, you don't hardly ever have endless flexibility. Um, you need to deliver on a certain project that's expected of you. And so you, you need to deliver on this project. But sometimes um, you need to maybe deviate slightly from this to just get output. Mm, of course, this has to be done communicating with all parties involved. And it may take um, a variety of different forms. But if something doesn't work, um, you need to be flexible to adjust your goals slightly and your, maybe also your topic ever so slightly. You know, for example, if it's too too difficult to work with entire communities, maybe you, you can work on isolates. So if it's too complicated to work on ecosystem modules, maybe you can downscale into, into smaller experimental systems. And I'm not saying that it doesn't pay off to be tenacious and stubborn. It does. I think um, tenacity is also <laughs> an important um, aspect of perseverance. Uh, don't give up at like every a sign of problems, but if you're just stuck, then you should also not be shy about uh, slightly changing um, the direction that you're going. And finally, also some, um, some advice in this category is be curious about stuff, learn things outside of your direct area of expertise, because, you know, the stuff that you take up when you're still uh, very young, I mean, we never really stop learning. Um, you will be able to maybe use them later on. And it's also part of being open and sort of ready for um, changing things when they don't work out the way you thought they did. Uh, in my case, in my PhD, the story was that I did a lot of um, controlled environment experiments with elevated CO2. The environmental controls failed to uh, because of no fault of mine, but um, in the end, I changed it more towards um, a field approach. So I just sampled existing field experiments and that in the end gave me um, the results I needed to complete a PhD. But it was, um, in the end, I had to be flexible and the way I had planned it, it simply didn't work. Uh, but the only reason I got a PhD in time is because I changed uh, basically to another approach and in the end that delivered. So I think if you keep all these four points in mind, they're all about strategy, really. Of course, they don't, are not a substitute for finding great ideas coming up with uh, fantastic um, new theories and approaches and um, innovative thing, ways of doing things. But um, um, sometimes just having an idea is not enough. You need also a lot of strategy to complete it all in the time that you have, and it's always limited. And so I think if you keep these four points in mind, your chance of success will increase. Hi there. If you like this video, don't forget to click like down there. And also remember to subscribe to the channel and feel free to leave comments. See ya.